Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 53. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hi. And we are going to be talking about Magic the Gathering, a topic I didn't expect when I started the Thoughtful Gamer. I was kind of done with Magic. At that point, we played a little bit casually in college, but yeah. not much since. But it's and, back. Uh, well, Arena is really what did it. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about our re-entry into this pillar of the gaming universe via its online implementation in Arena and what we think of the game and just kind of how how Magic has affected the gaming world because it's obviously very important. Yeah, hopefully interesting um, in terms of how it relates to other games, stuff like that. Yeah. But before we get into that, as always, our podcast is brought to you by you guys, our patrons who help support us. We've gotten a couple more in the last week, which is super exciting. Uh, So if you want to help out the podcast and help out the Thoughtful Gamer as a whole, go to patreon.com slash the Thoughtful Gamer. We really appreciate all your support. It's really exciting whenever someone, someone else hops in and we see their name pop up on the Discord. So in terms of how we're framing this discussion, I broke it down into kind of three things. First, we have Magic the Gathering as a game, looking at it as we would look at any other board game or card game that comes out, analyzing its pros and cons, what it does well, what it doesn't. The second main thing, main heading, I suppose, is Magic as an institution, so as something that has influenced games something that has influenced the business of gaming and kind of the whole hobby. And then finally, Magic is an online game, looking at what we've been experiencing with Magic through Arena and how that, in in my mind, is really helping bring this game to a a wider audience. But let's start with it as a game. Taking it a, a little bit out of context, out of its how big it is, how much money it makes how much it has widespread appeal more than say euro games how does magic function on its own and this is a really difficult question for me actually yeah no i think it's a really interesting there's a lot that goes into this are we are we are we looking at magic like the game that you and i play facing each other at the table in a complete vacuum there are a lot of problems with it frankly yeah. If if you look at it in a certain way that I would judge, you know, any two player game, there are a lot of problems with it. Yeah. Insofar as it created kind of a genre of game, I look at any kind of collectible or living card game or even not even ones that have that kind of expansiveness. Even just two player combative card games are are oftentimes kind of in response to magic. So you look at like Hearthstone which comes out and it takes the mana system, which is, we'll get to later, but always kind of the, one of the biggest stumbling blocks in Magic. And it's like, okay, we're just getting rid of that entirely. You always get one mana per turn. There aren't, your, there aren't different kinds of mana and you're just always on curve. And that, that, that certainly fixes a lot of issues, but it also introduces new issues. You look at my preferred, what I would say is the best of this kind of game that I've ever played, Netrunner, and it originally created by the exact same designer, uh, Richard Garfield. Richard Garfield. Uh, so kind of him looking at his own design. And you get a lot more freedom where you can always take one of your actions on your turn to get more money or all your actions. You could click three or four times and get three or four credits. So it opens it up a lot more and creates more of a sandboxy experience or at least frees it from those limitations. But just me looking back, because I, I enjoy reading games and kind of assigning numbers to them. And I think when I first got on Board Game Geek, I gave Magic like a five wow. out of ten. Okay. Like perfectly mediocre. You know, we'd fiddle around with it a bit in college, had some good times, but overall never stuck with me. Unlike some of our friend group uh, who have played it competitive or, you know, semi competitively since then. And then at some point, I think I bumped it up a bit because I'm, yeah, that's kind of snobbish. It's actually a decent game despite its flaws. And then recently, I think I gave it a seven and a half or eight after the drafting we did at PAX and the, and the, the limited formats we did. Because I'm like, yeah, I can't look at the game and rate it based on its like average experience. I need to give it a rating based on the implementation of that game sanctioned, right? I'm not going to rate a game based on house rules. 
but the sanction implementation of that game that I enjoy the best, right? That's the best experience for me. And for me, that's drafting. Yeah, yeah. And as so, a drafting game, as a drafting it's a seven and a half or eight for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's so hard to talk about a Magic because it is such a, a vast array of different experiences. But yeah, I think for this first part, for the most part, I think we do want to just talk about Magic as a drafting game. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the peak experience for be, me. It, so so let, let, let's let talk about the actual... Can we we talk about the actual game? Yeah, let's game. back up a bit. Let's back that's up a bit. That's kind of an overview. Let's, talk about, let's, go back, let's go back. Assume that we already have our decks. So we're we're just sitting down at the table. We're ready to go. We're going to play a game of Magic. So some quick thoughts on why... It's at least there's a hook here for me is that it's it's a quick 1v1 combat experience, right? In the same in a sense in the same way that like exceed or Star Realms. Star Realms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it gives you the feeling, I, I guess you know, the flavor of magic is that you're this powerful spell casting planeswalker being um, yeah, and i don't know the i don't know the magic lore that well but for those who are really uninitiated the idea of a planeswalker is they're they're basically like there's this superhero like they have something that allows them to jump between planes of existence and command things yeah it, it, it's cool and i, I think we're gonna there's talk, lots of backstory i, I want to talk about theme later but magic has this multiverse which allows it to draw from whatever theming it wants to and the planeswalkers are these beings that can can go anywhere they want kind of but that's who you are when you sit down at the table you're a planeswalker and you have and your powers are kind of defined by the deck that you bring to the table um so then you're you're sitting there at the table and you're playing lands um which are you know the source that you draw your power from and then you're using it to cast your summoning creatures and then you're doing other kind of sorcery stuff, um, and, and it's really vast the, the 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 kinds of things you can do. But at, at a basic level, you're casting creatures and then sending them against your your opponent. And then there you know there's some other nuances of uh, kind of different flavors that the different colors have. That experience, especially in like a ten minute experience, is really appealing. You know, if you if you just were going to tell me that this is like the newest. You know, the newest button shot game came out. That's just a quick 10 minute experience. Like magic gives me like certainly the kind of the pleasure I would ever want from that kind of short 1v1 experience. And and actually that was the initial intent. If you if you look at interviews and I've seen a couple of Richard Garfield, like they envisioned it as a casual game. You'd yeah, for buy sure. some packs, you'd throw together something that looked decent from those packs. And then you just play casually with your friends, not anticipating that it would become such a popular thing and, and something that people took very competitively. They had to make a lot of changes in terms of balance in those early years. People have asked, like, there there's some famous original cards uh, from the alpha version. Like, There's like six or seven that are really yeah, legendary. Yeah, so like Black Lotus is mm-hmm. the one that I was first told about. And it's basically this super cheap card that you can sacrifice. I believe it costs zero. Zero. Yeah. Uh, you can sacrifice it for three mana of any color. So, like, if you get that down on turn one, that means on turn two, you can cast this, like, big mid to late game spell. Yeah. Um, but, um, so, the question's asked of kind of the Magic Design team, you know, why would you do that? That's, like, could you not foresee that that's a problem? The answer is that, yeah, this is like a casual game we expect to be played in friend groups. Your friend group is probably going to only have one or two of these cards, you know, in the whole, you're not going to see it. And so, um, you know, they didn't expect it to be a problem. Right. And when they introduced the rarities system, right, they anticipate that rare cards are actually going to be rare in decks, not that they're just going to be rare in exactly. this market that is created. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, if you want to go to like an actual magic, like pro tournament or but I, I don't know exactly what they have like I forget what they're called they they completely revamped all the naming <laughs> system this past year i think yeah like your deck is going to be chock full of very rare cards because you want you have to build the best deck uh, and yeah. that might mean that you spend a thousand dollars to get those cards that's you know turn tournament style magic yeah so uh, okay mark continuing this thought did, did you have something you wanted to jump to uh, of of just like the game me versus you um, there are a lot of really fun things about kind of 
having your creatures and then there, there's there are bluffing elements because you don't know what spells your opponent has in hand. Um, you might have something in hand that you want to attack with your creatures and you want the opponent to block so that you can play your um, your buff spell or something like that. There's, there's various um, bluffing elements and I think the creatures are often referred to as the board state. And uh, depending on your strategy, like you might care more or less about the board state. But it, the simplest view... Um, is that you know you want your creatures on the board to be better than your opponent's creatures, and that allows you to attack or something, and then they have to choose between taking damage or basically sacrificing their creatures because they're they're not big enough to survive. I think that there are a lot of really fun little puzzles, like kind of like small number puzzles. They're like comprehensible, but there are enough possibilities that you can't be sure, and there there's some bluffing that that makes those those kind of number puzzles of creatures versus creatures, uh, really interesting. So uh, that's one thing just on a base level that I really enjoy about the game. Yeah, I mean, the bluffing element is certainly there, and especially when you have a mana system, that gives some knowledge to bluff around. Because if you hold back mana, in other words, if you don't spend all your mana on your turn, and you save some for your opponent's turn, then you potentially can play an instant spell, or interrupt as they used to be called, to mess up your opponent's plan. But it could be that you just didn't have the right cards to spend all your mana, or you're holding back deliberately to bluff to prevent them from doing something to enable a better turn for you next time. So that element of the game is actually quite strong, I think. It becomes less strong at... Well, I don't know. It becomes different at higher levels if you actually know, by and large, what's in your opponent's deck. And I think at the highest competitive levels, everyone knows the decks and the sideboards. Like, it's it's written down information that's given to each opponent, which makes it... You know, I haven't really played in that situation, but I assume it, it makes it an equally interesting but, but different bluffing game because you're bluffing more specifically. You might be holding back something to bluff that you have a very particular card rather than just generally, oh, they might have a counter spell. So this leads to one of the major problems of magic that I think then drafting addresses. But when you get in that situation where you both have like powerful decks that kind of follow what everyone says is the best deck and stuff like that, it does become more predictable. You know what's coming. You know, at that point, you're <laughs> there's less creativity because maybe you looked up the deck on the on online or something like that. I wouldn't necessarily say that's less creativity. It's a different kind. Yeah, it's a, it's a different kind. Um, I remember, and, and you're likely to have like a lot of the same cards because you're allowed up to four copies of the same card. There's some appeal to that, but I guess I don't know if you want to talk more about that style of magic. But I think so. Why I love drafts so much is you're kind of like dynamically shaping this your your deck from a common pool of cards in a way that's just so so limited so you're kind of like you end up building a deck eking out an advantage from everyone sitting at the table mm -hmm. um and, and you're limited by the card pool so you're not going to have four of the best card right uh, like you know it's just different but in terms of talking about magic as a game sitting down facing the other player playing that aspect of the game by and large i mean in terms of the different all the different ways you can play magic. So mm -hmm. the constructed formats, the, the really competitive tight ones like standard or modern, you have commander, which is a big, uh, a very popular thing uh, that that's a singleton deck, but has a few different rules uh, to limited. The actual plane of the round is sometimes the least interesting part across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when, it, randomness it takes a big hit on you yeah it certainly has a more like going through the motions you, you maybe like it i mean it depends it, it dep a lot it, it does depend uh i mean just one example is if you're playing like a blue control deck you're probably making more complex decisions about when to hold back and you know if you're playing a green stompy deck you just are trying to put out big things and then you know stomp throw some haymakers uh, <laughs> which is a lot of fun so i don't like there there are lots of there are lots of little tactical decisions in every game of magic mm -hmm. so it's not like it's 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 not like you're ever short on decisions they're kind of in that actual game like like you're saying i think they're they're far more limited sometimes yeah and in that that comes back to kind of the main weaknesses of magic so let's step back again 
things that are good about Magic as a game. I think it's thematically quite interesting. I think they've created a nice world there. A lot of the cards make sense with what they're supposed to represent. Yeah, I, th um, I think the theming big, is, is phenomenal. Big creatures have big hit points and toughness or in power and spells that have, you know, based on what the name of the spell is, they do kind of things that you would expect them to do. Fireballs do damage. Mind effect spells will affect like the player's uh Hand Let's come cards, back to theme because I want to like talk that. about theme later. But I think that's a big benefit of the game. Yeah. That, the bluffing, and then I think just kind of the variety of ways you can play is a big benefit of the game. The main disadvantages of the game and, and kind of the ease of play, right? It, it's it's simple. It's, it's quick. If you just want to play casually with a pre-constructed deck, it's very portable and quick to play and you don't need a lot of time or space to do so. The big downsides to magic as a game design are the randomness and the mm -hmm. snowballing and those are very hard to overcome and a lot of just so much of magic design and in introducing new cards and new sets is combating those two things yeah I, are you talking about snowballing in the course of a single game yes you're right but it's also a 10 minute game Right, but 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 as a competitive mm -hmm. game, yeah, right. That's why now. That's why you always do matches. You do best sure. out of three or best out of whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think it gets higher and higher levels, and they've experimented with mulliganing rules. Yeah, um, and I think they're about to change that even again to a different style. Of mulliganing. Yeah, basically that they're trying to increase the percentage of competitive games. Right, um, you know, eliminate games that someone just draws a bad hand and yeah. it's game over. But but just based on the inherent design of the game, that cannot be entirely avoided. It can't it's something be, it's, they actively have to fight against. You're you're right. Magic is it's kind of I, I, there's got to be a word for this. It's one of those games that has kind of like a forty to sixty percent win percentage. It's kind of like the baseball of board games. Sure, is that is that actually true competitively? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the um, I I looked at some win rates in, in like recent tournaments, and they broke it down by archetype. And I don't think any archetype that I saw was certainly not below thirty or above seventy. And I think it was even tighter than that. But I wonder, even not even just by deck archetype, but by player, right? Are are there players that consistently do well over and over again? Yeah, yeah, there or are. Is it again? Is it like a baseball thing where? the ones that do really well are winning like 60%. I, I don't know. I, I don't really know, but but yes. I mean, there's a pro league for for a reason. But but again, when you get into that, I mean, when we're talking about competitive magic, like then we're talking of layers of metagame yeah. where part of what makes those great players great is not only can they play the game well, they understand the metagame and can play the metagame extremely well. Sure. But anyway, like, so... There's enough randomness in magic that like I th it's it's just not going to stray that far from 50-50. I think the what saves it from that is that it is a 10-minute 20-minute experience, right? And, and that's where like a match is a lot of fun. Mhm. Mm yeah. And that's also where drafting gets another added layer of intrigue to me in that you're drafting not only to get the best cards in your deck but also create the most consistent deck possible that'll do what you want to do right pretty regularly that you don't in on the competitive level every deck is that right every deck is, is as consistent as it can be because they're optimizing the deck in draft you, that's part of the process of playing the draft mm -hmm. out casually though it does you know you said it's 10 20 minutes but still yeah if if magic was only a casual game without drafting without limited formats and it was just like throw some cards together. Like the interest to me is very low, and I think it's going back to my to my initial rating. It's like a five or six out of ten game. Sure, right? Yeah. Because the randomness combined with the snowballing is such a big issue. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally, like those totally two agree. by themselves are typically things that you want to avoid in games. Combined, it can get real bad. Yeah, because if you have you know, in, in, in Magic, when you talk about Magic strategy, you're using a lot of the same words that you would use in a game like chess or something. It's a lot of the same language that you're you're talking about with any two-player game. And, and one of the big ones is tempo, right? Once yeah. you get board advantage, it's very hard on a casual level to for your opponent to overcome that. Same with card advantage. 
those are two of the big things you talk about is board advantage and card advantage. Mm -hmm. Unless you get to like a combo deck or something that's going to do something really off the wall, but just kind of middle of the road magic. Once you get a good board position, your opponent needs a very good or a very good card or, you know, a good bomb rare or something specifically designed to overcome that situation to maintain, to, to get back some kind of balance. But those have to be balanced themselves, so they usually have to be contextual cards, so they cost weird amounts of mana or weird types of mana or something to balance out that they're going to overcome one of those main tempo advantages. So yeah, when you talk about basic magic strategy, yeah. you know, board advantage can be overcome by something that clears the whole board. But often those are expensive or very conditional or things like that. And, and rare. And they're rare cards, and, typically. And, and yeah. so um, that's something you see in Constructed, but uh, you don't see very much in Limited. In a, in a draft, that card doesn't come out much because it probably wasn't in your pool. Yeah, or there was one among the eight people and yeah. you know, someone first picked it, right? Yeah. Um, so as... As a game experience, it's okay, but it's elevated by all these other factors, I think, that yeah. make it really fun. Yeah. Yeah, there's just so much around. So you have, like, in a draft, you have you have the game. We've talked about that. You have the, the draft itself, which is super fun. Um, there's strategy to that of things like, well, what colors do I already have? Is it worth stretching for this really good card in a third color? You know, how late into the draft is too late to switch colors? That sort of thing. Yeah, the, yeah, the pivot. Yeah, the pivot. The dreaded pivot. Um, you're watching what cards come to you. You might realize after half of the first pack that a color that you're not drafting is super open. Do you switch and start taking those cards because you think that no one else is and you'll get more playable cards if you, if you switch to that color? The draft itself is kind of a, a second level of game that's super fun. And there's kind of a third level of just kind of like understanding the the possibilities. So like w when we drafted um, at PAX, we drafted a particular set, Ravnica Allegiance. And before we drafted, we were able to, you you knew, the, knew it before I did, and you gave me a rundown and you're like, I forget what it is. I think you said Demir is good. So like Demir's really good, yeah. You know your blue black cards are are probably good, and then then there were like two or three other archetypes that are particularly good. So there's that. Wait, no, no, Demir's in guilds. Oh, okay. Gruel's really good. Gruel. I like Gruel and really? Allegiance. Actually, all of them are really. I like Gruel. I like Allegiance Warsaw. is super balanced. Actually, Allegiance is really, really yeah. Actually, really Gil good. guilds was a, a less balanced guilds format. Was, was dominated by Boros and Demir. There you yeah. go. But so there's kind of that third level of kind of understanding where the format sits understanding where the possibilities are it might be worth if it's a format where there's you know one particular archetype that is particularly good then you might be drafting stretching a little bit more towards that but you also know everyone else might be trying to do the same thing yeah so in a draft situation where you're drafting a particular format um, it's those levels of of game the kind of game going on at like three different levels that that is most appealing I think. Yeah, and it's it's so you can keep going for deeper and deeper and deeper into it in terms of how much you're paying attention to the whole of the cards you're getting each hand, how much information you can process, right? Mm -hmm. Because for me, I'm at the point where it's like, you know, okay, you pick the first couple picks, you pick the best card, whatever. Doesn't matter what color it is, doesn't matter at all. Pick the best card and then see where you'll go in terms of narrowing down to a color. That's where I'm at. The next level is like looking at the whole of the card pool and trying to figure out, okay, if this wheels around. So in other words, if you're in a normal draft with eight players, you're, the, the deck that you open, the pack that you open is going to come back around you on pick nine. Mm -hmm. And understanding what kind of signals you can gain from that knowledge of, of, of remembering what was in that pack, yeah. noticing what <laughs> other people pick, and then trying to predict the general trends of what everyone else is drafting, like that's high level stuff, and that's so cool. I don't do it. No, I don't do it at all. That'd be very hard. The, the, it is, but it's something I kind of want to try the, to the think most, about. The most I do is I I look at the pack that someone passes to me and say, "Wow, there's a lot of blue in this pack. I guess nobody's picking blue." You know? Yeah, yeah. And and there's even I've I've heard in pod other podcasts about magic the idea of Picking cards not necessarily because they're 
the best one that you would pick, but specifically to send a signal to the person next to you that, hey, I'm really going hard into this color or these two colors can be a strategy as well. That that might be if you understand that the person next to you is also thinking on the, that level of For course. For sure, yeah. But you can get really deep into the actual drafting of magic. And that by itself is a fun game. Like even if you don't play many actual games of magic afterwards with that deck, the actual drafting of it is almost the best part. Yeah, no, I mean, we drafted last Thursday, last week, and certainly in terms of time, the draft took longer than the actual matches. Yeah, we got two matches in. And was the most exciting part. When we actually played, the exciting part was drafting and then taking the card pools that we we had each drafted and, and honing them into what we thought was the most effective deck. Mm-hmm. And then playing them out is is a little more rote. It's sure. kind of like, okay, I've done the strategy. I've done all the thinking. Now we're going to just play it out. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And even just the discussions we were having during and right after the draft are really interesting because in that situation, we did a four-player draft, which is not recommended usually you want at least six and i can see why now because initially none of us were going for blue (laughs) and then i think about halfway through the first pack we all realized that no one was picking blue cards and then two of us started picking blue cards even though we didn't really want to Uh, but we both had very we might have had the two strongest decks out of the out of the four yeah just because we got our pick of like prime blue cards yeah all right we, we said we mentioned this a little bit before about the theme of magic, and I think it actually does quite a good job. I, I talked about this actually on a podcast I, I was a guest on, the Every Night is Game Night podcast a few weeks ago. And I think magic actually does quite a good job with theming their game more so than most card games, which I think kind of borrow a lot from magic, but don't get, they don't quite understand to what extent magic really thinks about theming their games into crafting a story, even in a f- what can be a really mechanically focused gameplay experience. Now, obviously, if you're playing at the highest level, you're not really thinking about that. You're just thinking about the mechanisms. But for most players, I think there's a lot of enjoyment to come out of the way different colors interact with the story behind magic, with the art and the, and the, the really good uh, flavor text they've been putting in lately. I really have been enjoying... Uh, reading the flavor text from the latest set into this kind of overall narrative, even though once you get to actually playing it out in a game, it's more like a collage. You're getting bits and pieces of narrative and you can kind of work it together in your head. It, it, it's very hard to cohere that into something Yeah, I think in the, terms of the momentum of the game, but you are getting bits and pieces of something kind of cool. Yeah, I think the theme is relevant in, in the actual game, but but it's different. So uh, at the high level, Magic has maybe one of the strongest theming settings of any of the games we play. Part of it is because it's a game that is living. It's a living game. So like they're telling a story over years and years and years. Actually, I think War of the Spark just finished a, a three-year arc. Like, oh, really? It's a three-year it's thing? A, yeah, okay. the, the, the Bullas, the dragon. Bullas, yeah, he's Bullas, the villain. The, the dragon. He... He's trying to. Like, he, he was the big baddie all for the, the last souls of the planeswalkers or something. Yeah, he he went to. Um, they had an Egyptian theme set like a year ago, where he went there and conquered that plane, and that's how he got the uh, the god Eternals, the uh, the Egyptian gods. He killed. Oh. He killed them, and then they came back as zombie gods for S- War of the Spark. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, this makes so <laughs> much more sense now. Anyway, so like, there's there's narrative that goes back literally 20 years we were just on a three-year arc so in terms of like story like there's a lot there in terms of narrative philosophy though i think this is where the game shines maybe beyond any other board game that i've played is each of the five colors has like a color philosophy that really defines what that color is about and then that bleeds into what mechanics the color is allowed to have and the kind of cards it has. Just real quick, like white is kind of like collective and orderly. Blue is about knowledge. Black is kind of like selfish. Deals a lot with death. Deals a lot. Zombies and death vampires. Death or like doing whatever it takes to get what you want. I think sure. is how I'd, I'd describe it. Uh, red is all about emotion and kind of just doing. <laughs> it, it's the most 
The id. The id. The quick action, you know. And, and then green is the natural way of things. Um, so just as monocolors, like those those kind of values shape the play style for all of the colors. And then, you know, as, as we were talking earlier about our draft, like you almost always put at least two colors into your deck. And so then you get cool interactions of how those philosophies intersect and kind of conflict, but also have overlap. Um, and that'll often define kind of the, the character of, of your deck. Well, and then they've introduced, or I don't know when, but they have the guilds in Ravnica, which yeah. are all 10 of the two teller combinations, which have this kind of story role. So you have like Boros, which is white and red, which on their face seem kind of counter, but they really did a good yeah, job of so, mixing it together. Boros is just the guard unit, right? Yes. It's, it's aggression it it's, and order. Yeah, it's the... Um, yeah, I looked this up because because it's what I drafted in yeah, a, yeah. L- last week. They're like just the guards, right? They're they're yeah, that's their job. They're the the military military or the police force. Sure, but it, yeah, it's this idea of law and order. Where does that intersect with action? It's the enforcement. And then the, what I think is really cool is uh, Orzov because you have white and black, which yeah. are really opposite. So how do you combine those two things? Well, you have this like religious police. It's like religious crime syndicate. Yeah. It's like organized crime. And did you know, Flavorly... Flavorly? Is that a word you've in- invented here? I, apparently. I like it. Uh, yeah, Flavorly, they're, that guild is ruled by a council of ghosts. <laughs> I love it. Which, it has some of the collectivism of white, but has kind of like the, the secretive, I don't know, death. <laughs> of black yeah yeah um i think my favorite though just in terms of pure flavor is simic oh yeah which is white or which is green blue green blue and so you have kind Na- of blue which you have wants nature to versus manipulate. nurture well you have blue which wants to like manipulate things and you have green which is all about natural progress so again two things that seem in in conflict but the way they represent it is this like biological experimentation guild where they mutate animals and uh try to like progress evolution on their terms which is we get some really funny stuff like these giant jellyfish or so yeah and so one of the really cool things about magic is each set has like a subset of mechanics that go into it it's one of these games that has a system and then the cards just add rules to that system. It's very Dominion in that sense. Well, I mean, Dominion was directly inspired by Magic Draft. I didn't know that, but... Oh, yeah, no. The idea that he had was he wanted to build a game that gave him what he liked about Magic yeah, Drafting. Perfect. And then he's like, wait a minute, what if we didn't separate the drafting and the game, but instead made... Instead, combine them where you draft your deck as part of the game. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, that was the but, origin. But yeah, I mean, one of the big things of Magic is that the rules text on each card supersedes kind of the, the basic rules always. So each set has kind of a, a subset of, of mechanics that go into it. But they'll pull mechanics that make sense, fla- you know, in a flavor sense. So like we were talking Simic and gr- Green Blue. Mm-hmm. And Boros, red, white, which is kind of what we drafted. Uh, you had three colors, but that's kind of what we played. Sure. Uh, the Boros mechanic was mentor, which is this mechanic that says when you attack with a mentor, they can give a plus one, plus one counter to a creature with smaller power. So it it increases, or sorry, it encourages aggression. So mm-hmm. it wants to play quick just as a mechanic. Uh, Because you want to attack, because you want to gain value through Mentor. And it also gives a sense of collectivism, of uh, my creatures work together and help each other out. Uh, Simic, what you played, the green-blue, has the adapt mechanic, which is just, you know, pay this cost at some some point in the game, and your creature gets way bigger. And it's this idea that, like, through knowledge of and, and bioengineering, we can just make our stuff better. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in each, uh, you know, incredibly, each of the 10 guilds in the Ravnica block have those sorts of mechanics tied in with with theme. Yeah, yeah. Um, based on those those two color pairs. 
And then Orzov, uh, which has the ghost oh, yeah. cancel, uh, it is afterlife, yeah. where certain creatures, when they die, they come back as spirits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see. Are, are there any other favorites of... Oh, um, in terms of the mechanisms? I, I mean, flavorfully convoke from Selesnia. So White Green has this idea of convoke, which is rather than pay full cost, their creatures can like help pay for bigger creatures. So you get that kind of collectivism, natural working together. Web of life is kind of the white green thing. I really like spectacle, not only thematically, but from a gameplay uh, perspective. Yeah, so that's that's red that's black. With, you have cards that have different costs. So the normal cost and then the spectacle cost, which is usually just cheaper. You can cast the card for cheaper. Uh, but only if you've damaged an opponent that turn. So it's the keyword for Rakdos, which is red black, which again wants to be really aggressive. Yeah. I th- um, so it encourages aggr- aggressiveness. It also makes, from a gameplay perspective, some really fun decisions where normally if you're in a situation where your creatures are better, they're just going to trade better or they're going to be able to block without dying against particular creatures. And if you're in that kind of situation, someone attacks you. It's usually a sign that they have some kind of trick in hand where they can buff up their creature or, or something like that to get a favorable trade out of it. But when you have spectacle as part of your decision making, all of a sudden it's like, okay, they could be bluffing that they have a combat trick and actually just want you to not block so that they can get through damage me and then get to play a card at a better tempo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, really it, nicely done there. In the red black is the most action oriented pair. Yes, because it's like emotive, but and also selfish. Literally a carnival troop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, here I have. I have one of the bigger cards here. Judith, the Judith. Oh, yeah, Judith, the Scourge Diva. Yes, and she does. She gives other creatures that you control plus one, plus zero. And whenever a non-creature token you control dies, Judith, the Scourge Diva, deals one damage to any player. So it's it's been said that Rakdos red black throws the best parties you may not come out alive but it's just yeah, like there's a this, lot of like, that so they have the they have the the two two that you can sacrifice one of your own creatures to do two damage to the enemy directly each turn yeah including itself that's very rakdos and then of course their their big big card is Rakdos. is uh yeah rakdos is a, the, no, Rak- Stosh- yeah, the showstopper, showstopper yeah. where basically you Play them, and then every creature has a coin flip to win or die, <laughs> or to lose, to, to Wait, live what, or die. What's the bad guy from No Country from One Man? Sugar, Sugar. He's he, his name is pronounced many different ways. Okay, he's very not Rakdos though. So no, no. I think he's colorless. You think he's a, he's an artifact creature? Yes. No, I think he's. Uh, what would he be? He's he's the absence of. I don't know. Is it? They're like scientists. He's not red at all. You don't think he's like Nihilus. Yeah. I think he's colorless. Let me think. White black? Golgari, maybe? Mm, there's nothing natural about That's true. I think blue's got a he's not Demir. They're like spies. I guess he could be Demir. I think or Orzov, Orzov. Orzov is the closest, but I think he's colorless. I think it's okay. kind of this uh unaffiliated I think we are the first people <laughs> in the history of the world to talk about no country for old men and magic the gathering at the same time it's possible we could tweet this to uh, mark rosewater the the head designer he would totally answer our question is he a cohen brothers fan or uh i know that he's a media fan okay but and i know that he loves talking about the color <laughs> pie because i followed him on twitter a couple okay. weeks ago because i am excited. I should about... follow him on twitter if he's yeah he he will definitely answer your question about about fictional Vi- characters. villains and where they fall in the color pie. <laughs> nice, nice. It's. I mean, you always have the classic, like you have the D and D system, the alignment yeah. system. Yeah, but I think this is more interesting. The the houses for sure, because yeah, you can you get sp- splashed of the colors, and, and this is just where I think. Although it's it's much easier with Shigar. He's clearly lawful evil. Yes, on the D and D. Yeah, for sure. Because he, I mean, the laws being some weird formation of his own mind, but he follows them rigidly. Yeah. Um, and, and this is where I think magic really has this like kind of philosophical flavor core that's baked into it that kind of enables 
the theme to succeed so well. And, you know, when you pick up the game for the first time, do you understand, you know, the color pie and, and, you know, what differences there are? No, but... You get it real quick. You get it real quick. And just reading, like you you said, the art and, and the flavor text and just the kinds of things that the different colored cards do, you get very distinct flavors. And then, like, by your third game, when your opponent plays a green mana... You have a really good idea of how that their deck's going to play. Yeah. You know, that doesn't maybe change what you do very much, but it, it might a little bit. And and it's just a testament to to initially Garfield creating a really cool idea in a cool system. But I think even more so it's a testament to when a game's around for it's over 25 years now. Yeah, tw- over 25 years, right? Is 93. 91, I think. Or yeah, maybe 93. I think it's 93. Yeah. Uh, when you have 25 years with a, with a product, like, and it does well, you put a lot of thought and work into these kind of principled questions of what you want to do while leaving it wide open enough to have innovation. So there's, I think in Magic, more than you know, 99% of games that are created, there's a lot of thought that's put into how do we expand this while still remaining consistent? Does this work on a thematic and a mechanical level? What kind of complications or interesting decisions? Like they're at the point where they have the system. It's just now iterating in interesting ways and they can talk yeah. about the game design differently than just someone trying to create yeah. a standalone game. We, we should talk real quick about War of the Spark. Just like real quick. Sure. Most of what we've been talking about is the Ravnica Allegiance set, which we've drafted more Mm -hmm. of. Which, by the way, is by far the best drafting set I've ever played. It's so good. It's awesome. Not that I've played many. (laughs) Played four or five. But, well, that's also something that they can now spend time doing, though, right? Is making sure, because they have to evaluate each set in terms of how it's going to impact the constructed play as well as how good it is in a drafting or limited situation and they hit it out of the park with the yeah. Although war I think is very good also. Yeah, when they design a set, a set comes out, there will be cards in there that you're like, I would never draft that, but I can see how some theory crafter is going to put it into a constructed deck. <laughs> Especially like a commander deck or something, some weird yeah. combo enabling stuff. And then there's stuff that's just like, well, that's just an underpowered creature, but they had they put it in there for draft balancing reasons. Maybe they thought that color was a bit too powerful, so they're going to throw a common in there that's not good yeah. just to kind of balance it out. So every once in a while, someone's kind of half forced to play that yes. if they're going that color. So this um, so this block, there were the two guild sets, and then War of the Spark was the third yeah. set this year. So it's uh, Guilds of Ravnica, then Ravnica Allegiance, then War of the Spark is this part of this... What do they call it? Block. A block, yeah. Yeah. So War of the Spark mechanically did something very different than the first two. The first two were all about the guilds. So you have these mechanics that that embody the character of these 10 two-color pairs. In the third set, it it moves away from being about the guilds, although the guilds are still there. And it's about this giant climactic battle with all these planeswalkers so the big thing they did for this set which they have never done before is they promised that they're in every single booster pack there will be a planeswalker we, at least one we haven't talked about what that is a, a planeswalker card represents like an ally that you can summon to the battlefield and, and then they will have abilities that kind of create or make them more loyal to you or use up loyalty to do more powerful things Uh, but the idea is that you're kind of calling in a friend and then they sit next to you on the battlefield and and can do things usually they're only they're extremely rare so you might i believe they're always rare before oh yeah literally rare i believe more the spark is the first time ever there's been an uncommon planeswalker and there was dozen of them or so yeah but so in war of the spark you're you know, in a typical draft, you're picking up two or three of them almost always. Yeah. And in, in in addition to having these unique abilities that make the game more complicated, they all have these passive abilities that will will do something that changes the way the game's played. A, a lot of them are something like, well, like, for example, Domri of the, the Red Green Guild mm-hmm. just gives plus one power to each creature. 
And that, you know, that's the flavor of the guild, but that can make a big difference when you're, you know, when, when, when it's about a creature battle, the board state plus one power on every creature makes a big deal. Uh, and, and, and there are just so many of them that affect the game in so many unique ways that it, 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 it makes for a much more complex format. Yeah, War, and I didn't really think about it till I heard another podcast talking about it, but, but War of the Spark really is substantially more complex in terms of gameplay decision making than other sets. So I wouldn't recommend it as an entry point for sure. But I found that the playing out the games has been a lot more interesting, certainly more interesting than Guilds of Ravnica, which felt pretty rote once you've drafted your deck. Allegiance is a really nice middle ground, but War of the Spark, there's a lot of really interesting complex decision making because there's just more text you have to worry about. Yeah. There's more interactions. You're dealing with more planeswalkers, which create a whole nother level of complexity in, in, in decision making there. So it's a very interesting set. Yeah. So just as a, just as like, I guess, pulling back to kind of magic as a product, it's just super interesting that they can do two sets a couple months apart. It's the same game, but the things that they've put into the set make it play out so differently. It makes the the draft format play out so differently. It makes the actual one-on-one matches play out so differently. And that's just a super interesting thing. All right, I, I could keep talking about drafting allegiance and or war of the spark forever, but let's let's broaden our view a bit, or at least shift it a bit, and look at magic as an institution, magic as kind of a cornerstone of hobbyist gaming, so much that it's kind of become its own thing. It's it's kind of a standard talking point that magic is what keeps game stores alive. Yeah, it's such a huge chunk of their profits and. You know, in some sense, that's a, it's a really nice thing for us board gamers is that magic gives us this externality where we can go to local game stores where maybe, you know, 50, 60 percent of their profits are magic. But, you know, they also stock board games and maybe have board game events. So that's really cool. But it does so through this trading card model, which I don't think any game had done since then. It's I don't know if it was explicitly borrowed from like baseball trading cards, but it, it, just I, the I idea of it. That, I think that Richard Garfield drew from baseball cards. That's the only other thing prior to Magic I can think of that is called trading cards. Yeah. Although with baseball cards, it's not. It's just collecting. It's collecting. There's, there's no game you play with it. Yeah. So it has this model, and there, uh, there are a lot of people who don't like it. I don't think it's ideal. I, I really liked the living card model that Netrunner had better, but... If your game is a hit, like Magic is, they have been able to rake in a lot of money, and now they can do things that that just don't exist with other games in terms of prize support, in terms of hosting tournaments, in terms of getting something like Magic Arena out, really high quality, uh, good stuff, in terms of having consistent, consistently high and exceeding expectations releases in terms of sets having r&d teams you know there's a lot of people employed in making making magic the gathering that you that's something you just don't see very much outside of that in the hobby gaming space but it also creates the secondary market yeah it so in one sense being primarily a board gamer where i'll do some research and decide on what games i want buy them and then i have the full package until maybe an expansion comes out but you don't have to get that you know, this idea that you just get some random cards and some packs, and then you have to go to the secondary market to buy specific things. It does feel exploitive in some sense. Like, that's that's my initial reaction is like... You're, yeah, I've <laughs> kind of thought that. Not, not but, exploitative necessarily, but it's just... Yeah. It, it, I don't want to use that word. That's my first feeling when I, you know, when I, when I first... No, they, the, the, they, I'm no not, I understand. I, I don't. Right? I don't think it is that. But that that's kind of the feeling that I I first get. I think that ultimately, what I've come come to to think is that Magic just supports so many different ways of playing. One of those ways is kind of this expensive, pay lots of money to get the things that you want. It supports that, and I'm okay with that now. That's never going to be me. Yeah, it's. But but like there are ways to play that I fit into the magic 
landscape, you know, I play draft. Yeah. I hesitate to use exploit because it's all it's all voluntary payments like you're paying you know you know what you're paying for but on the other hand it is kind of a gambling like system it in terms of just how the booster packs function and i talked about this with uh, my article about gloomhaven and the skinner box so uh, yes yeah. skinner box idea is that there are certain payout rhythms that you can have that increase the chances of someone doing a repeated action over and over. So the, the, the simplest example is a slot machine. And in some senses, a magic booster pack is like a slot machine. You know it's going to have a rare. There's a, You know there's a 15% chance, I think, that that rare is going to be a mythic. And certain rares and mythics are going to be much more valuable than others, e- both in terms of valuable in that you want that card for whatever deck you're thinking of, or just value in terms of its its price on the secondary market. I don't necessarily have a problem with that kind of model. I don't like it and I don't, well, I don't like, to me, it's not fun to participate in that directly. Yeah. I don't, I've got, I've been gambling once and I play blackjack because there's actually a game there. The idea of a slot machine is just not fun to me at all. I can understand why it pulls you in. In fact, a lot of the games that I play to kind of relax, like video games, are similar. They have kind of Skinner box feels to them. So like my baseball simulation game, right? Yeah. Uh, it's A lot of it's just kind of playing out that simulation, and I make decisions, and those decisions are interesting. But a lot of the appeal is just like, oh, man, if I put if I put Babe Ruth on this on the Cardinals instead of the Yankees, what happens in the 30s and 40s? Just kind of press the button and see, as an example. <laughs> <laughs> But it gets much more tricky when you're talking about kids and whether or not kids should be exposed to that yeah. kind of Skinner box thing because their brains aren't as developed. We have, as a society, and I think rightly so, different expectations of what constitutes consent or things like that in terms of children's minds. And it gets tricky. It's a good business decision, obviously. It's done very well for them. And now that I'm playing, I'm looking at Magic more as a game where I go draft or play limited formats, uh, I can see also how that factors into kind of this this kind of cycle, right? Because people, I think, have this misconception that if you want to get into Magic, you buy a bunch of booster packs, like you buy hundreds of them and you spend a ton of money and then you have to get the cards you want. But if you're doing Constructed, you don't buy packs. Like, you just don't. You buy specifically the cards you want and you build that deck. How do you get the? How do those cards get into existence? Well, I you know partially it's just people who buy booster packs just because they like booster packs, but largely I think it's people who play limited. Right? Yeah, you open the packs in order to play a game, and then you cycle those into the secondary market where people who play are, are playing a different game with the same components get the opportunity to buy them. So it's a it's a neat little cycle actually in yeah. the secondary market that they've created. And I think that's part of the reason why Magic really supports the limited formats. When, you know, initially when Magic's created, I don't think that they had that in mind at all. No, I think that came in like four or five years after yeah. after it started. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting. It's it's such a different model than any of the board gaming that we normally do. It's so much more interactive with the system kind of, mm-hmm. which is fascinating. The flip side of that is is the communities that you kind, of, you kind of talked about earlier. In terms of like gaming communities, I think like D&D still, you know, brings, huge. brings yeah. people together, you know, at your gaming store. But Magic is probably the biggest. Yeah, at least in America. At least in America. I know there are some other trading card games that are really popular oh, okay. in Japan that are not Magic. I know Wizards sells others or sold I, others. I think I remember in some interview where there's there are there's a different trading card game. I think in Japan, maybe Korea. I don't know. Uh, that's more popular than Magic there. But. Yeah, but I think it's really cool to hear stories of people that get excited to go on. I think it's usually Friday Night Magic, and they have a group of friends, and and it it costs. You know, it, it costs some money. You you have to buy the packs that you're going to play with. If you're doing limited, Friday Night Magic isn't always limited. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. I think it's that's just, true. yeah. from what I understand, it's also where people go meet up to play Commander or Standard or oh, yeah, okay. Modern or Vintage or any of the other yeah. constructed formats. And, and certainly bringing people together in a gaming store is good for Wizards of the Coast because that that fuels their you know sales cycle. Sure, yeah. So it's interesting. But it, it's also good for those people. Like getting together yeah, and, and having right. friends and that kind of community, that's a 
very good advantage. So. Yeah, for sure. So it's just so interesting. Why hasn't that sort of thing happened with, you know, the rest of the board game hobby? Well, in some sense it has. It's just Magic has a critical mass where they can do that in person. Yeah. Right? So, for example, you know, we talked last week or last podcast about 18xx. There's a very strong, robust 18xx community, but it's largely over the internet because there's just not enough people playing 18xx to have, you know, in any medium-sized city to have a meetup every week. Yeah. We've been fortunate that we have a few friends that were into 18xx and we kind of got a group together. But with any kind of lifestyle game like this where they're banking on kind of it's sustaining over a long period of time through iteration or or storytelling continuation uh, where they want people to really embrace it you need to hit some sort of critical mass for that to sustain and part of the issue is that there's only so much attention that can be passed around so magic has a pretty good foothold there you can get have mild successes you have things like fantasy flights x-wing uh, you have Warhammer, which is its own thing that's been around a long time and a lot of sustain uh, there. But it's not a whole lot that is coming close to magic in terms of that sustainability and that mass of people that want to play it every week and have continued investment in the game. It's just hard to do. It's like it's like MMORPGs, right? Yeah. World of Warcraft's been really hard to topple. And there have been some competitors and some fairly successful ones, but that one stuck around and just was able to sustain itself. So it's a, it's, it's a really interesting ecosystem. I'm coming to a place where I think it's really cool. And, you know, my, my place in it is I'll buy a few booster packs every couple of months and, and do limited. And then I'm mostly free to play on Let's, let's be clear here. You're, you're, you're opening those packs as part of a limited thing. Yeah. You're right. not opening the packs for no Correct. value, Matt. Come on. I didn't say no value. You gotta get a you gotta draft with them or limited or yeah yeah or, draft draft yeah, yeah yeah totally yeah yeah no I will I just want to be clear to our Absolutely. audience where we stand on opening packs you gotta draft or you gotta draft do something them. with it draft them it is fun now to look at the other parts of that system that I don't foresee myself doing more of I don't think I'm gonna ever you know drop a thousand dollars on a deck and play competitively but I'm cool with that yeah. And in, in just talking about this kind of bleed over effects on the popularity of Magic. So we talked about how it sustains game stores, uh, which has been a boon to board gamers because they have more game stores they wouldn't have access to otherwise. I think being able to explore a design for so long has kind of broadened at a design level our understanding of game design, even maybe especially because Magic inherently is kind of this imperfect game as we talked about all the methods they've used to combat that and get around that and still create new innovations. You get a lot of design knowledge by reading and listening to people who design Magic the Gathering. I've seen a couple of presentations, probably by the guy you talked about, Rosewater, about mm -hmm. design things throughout the years. I think there was a talk at GDC a couple years ago that was very, very, very good. I I'd like to point out Mark Rosewater has like a podcast and a design blog like if you're interested in listening to a guy who is really enthusiastic about magic and game design, I'd recommend checking out his stuff. Yeah. Um, there's some real gems hidden in his. his well, even like a media. classic thing, even back in the early days of magic, the Timmy uh, Johnny yeah. Spike thing, which if you haven't heard of it, it's this kind of three hypothetical players that they think about when they're designing a, a, a set that they want to cater to all three. So you have, I forget, which one is, what Spike is, is the super competitive player who just wants to win, wants the net deck. Timmy Tammy is the one who uh, wants to play really big, cool things. Oh, they want big, cool, awesome stuff. And that means Johnny wants to express themselves individually, right? Yeah. yeah. Jo Johnny wants to be creative. Jenny is the creative one who wants to win, but wants to do it in a really sweet way. Yeah. And that, that, that understanding of different kinds of players, like they're more robust complex understandings of that that have or at least hypotheses of, of, of different types of players that have come out since then but I find that one so far to be still the most the most helpful in terms of thinking about how games can appeal to different players than any of the other ones I've seen uh, even though it's probably the most simplistic so those kinds of bleed over effects to board gaming are really interesting and then 
just strategically the way we talk about games is often influenced by Magic the Gathering. So, you know, tempo as a concept has existed a long, long time when looking at chess and go, but the idea of card advantage or board advantage and understanding the limitations of Magic. So when I look at a design like Netrunner, again, same designer as Magic, I can see where he's actively combating those kinds of things and just understanding the difference in design and how that changes the way the game is played between Magic and Netrunner, I think is maybe better at analyzing games because it's such a cool comparison. So it's, it's, it's almost this like honing rod where you can look at games and compare them to principles that you see in Magic the Gathering yeah. and get a greater understanding. It, it's, it's hilarious that Dominion was a direct design riff on Magic because I was, I was expecting that we would talk about those differences. But yeah, the idea that like the cards can introduce rules. Yeah, the rules um, are exported you know, to the cards. Yeah. I, I don't know that like card driven war games got that from Magic, but I, I kind of understand it in the same light um, as, as so much of the game is on the cards. That'd be something interesting to ask Mark Herman. I don't know if I've read if Magic was influenced, whatever, the, uh, was it Washington's War? Was that the first one? I forget what the first card driven war game was. I don't know about that one. Yeah, lots of knowledge to be gained there by exploring that design. So the last thing we wanted to talk about was Magic Arena, which is their fairly new online implementation of the game. There was one before then that's been around quite a long time, Magic the Gathering Online or MitGo, uh, that I have not played, but I've seen, and it, it looks ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it looks very poorly designed Ma- from a Magic. UI perspective. Yeah, what is it called? Magic the Gathering Online? Yeah. And it looks like it's trying to just re-implement the table. Yeah, but really bare bones. Uh, looks like Windows 95. Yeah. It's real ugly. I have no desire to ever explore that. But now they have the new flashy one, you know, on the level of Hearthstone uh, in terms of production values. And it's really, really well done. And it single-handedly has got me more interested in this game where before, you know, I was kind of done with it. I would play it maybe if someone else was interested in doing something, but being able to play on Arena and then therefore be able to play just kind of easily online and therefore understand the meta and understand the sets and understand the cards has kind of reinvigorated my my interest in the game because now I'm thinking about it on a different level. Yeah, I mean, the, the number one difference is just the ease of play. Um, yeah, because it, it, it reduces the costs of playing Magic on every level. Like, I would say... In the, terms the, of accessibility yeah. into finding a game, accessibility in terms of price, in terms of learning the game, in terms of dealing with other people, like, it's just easier to play. I'd say the average amount of time I spend in one se- session of, of Arena is about, like, 25 minutes. Like for me, like I can just get on and play. If if I'm doing a draft, maybe I draft all my cards and then, you know, I'll play the matches the next night. Or if I'm, you know, just kind of, I don't know, grinding, uh, whatever, I'll just drop into the ranked queue and play three matches and then maybe, you know, three or four and then be done. Yeah. And we touched on this earlier, like the strategic and tactical depth of that experience isn't super high. But I got to play three games in a really short amount of time. So I I end up feeling like that was a lot of value. Right. And Magic has never been, at least for me, maybe it's different for other people. It's never been the kind of game where the fun has been in playing it with another person. It's always been about your interaction with the game mechanisms. And some games are like that. Uh, I think Castles of Burgundy did really well for me online as an online implementation because it's just that kind of game. Now, obviously, if you have the dedicated group of friends and you all play Magic together, that can be wonderful. But in terms of a super casual player like me who doesn't necessarily keep up with things until Arena, of course, there's a kind of a social barrier to entry uh, just in terms of knowledge. And there's also a rules barrier. We didn't talk about this when talking about kind of the, the negatives to Magic as a design, but it's... There's so a lot of stuff you have to know and a lot of words you have to remember the meanings of and a lot of interactions, you know, even just under, once you understand the idea of the stack, that doesn't necessarily, that gets you like 80% of the way there, but there's always that 20% that can kind of throw you off of when someone has the ability to play a card and then in which order that resolves. Yeah. And the implications for the thing reactions. that you already played. Yeah. yeah. Um, Arena smooths all that out. 
Like yeah. you don't, you're not interacting directly with another player unless you know it's a friend you're playing online against. Uh, Arena and actually it, makes it, it easier to learn all that stuff. Well, it makes it easier to learn, and you don't have to worry about some weird edge case. It just does it for you. Yeah, yeah. And even if like you really get you know screwed over by not understanding some intricacy, again, you just you lost a game that took ten minutes to play, and now you know. <laughs> right. And also in terms of a value proposition for your money, for a free-to-play game, it's it's got to be the best one I've seen. Yeah, if you are strictly free-to-play, if you get on and play like three or four days that You'll, week, I guess you'd have to play like maybe like five days. Four to, I'd say four to five. You'll have a draft. Then, then you'll get enough in-game currency to do a draft. And then between one to three drafts, we'll find another draft. Yeah. In, so, the, in their secondary currency. So it's um, it's incredibly easy to just do that. Now, if you want to compete in constructed in like the high levels, you're not going to do that free to play. Um, it'll take a bit of time. It'll take I a bit of time. Could, I think you could do it. Yeah. Because even then, like you're constantly earning things. And if you even if you invest a little bit of money, it, it reaps rewards kind of exponentially because that helps you earn more. And I've spent a fair bit of money on it. And I, I feel like it's worth it. Like I've spent a couple hundred bucks probably. And I have, I probably could have close to a full play set of any card I want. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting, I have, I have six top tier net decks. I don't care about constructed and in, innovative decks. I'm, I'm a spike in that regard for constructed play. Just that I've looked up and I still ha- could make probably 40 mythics or 65 rares from like the wild cards I have. Yeah. Like, I I have everything yeah. I could possibly need. I guess I've been playing in real life in Paper Magic. That would cost thousands and thousands yeah. of dollars. Right. In, in Paper Magic, each of those top tier decks would be between four hundred and twelve hundred dollars. Uh, the, uh, the the only top it depends. Like I mono mean, red, you can get for like a hundred. Mono red, m- mono red is the only one that is under that. Uh, last time I checked. And even then, a big chunk of that is going to be your dual lands. And mono red sometimes will splash black. But if you go pure mono red, I, I bet you can make something that's very close to the top tier for 80. But that's about it. Yeah. Like, everything else is going to need some good mythics to... But I, I've got that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm fully content. And it was, in terms of magic, relatively inexpensive. And I've been able to draft dozens and dozens and dozens of times over the past few months. Yeah. And that's really what I'm getting out of it. Yeah, and, that's what I love. And we're obviously Mark and I are big fans of of the draft. I think that's the best way to play. I think that's the most that's the closest thing to a board game experience that you're going to get out of Magic. So, I mean, that's what we recommend. That's that's high value. It's yeah, it is true that there are ways that you can play on Arena where you will either be very frustrated or you will spend lots of money. But, I mean, to me, those those ways just aren't as interesting. You know, yeah, the, you know what you're describing of the draft thing, and, and I've I only bought the welcome pack, so I've only spent five bucks. Yeah, uh, on it, and I still feel like I'm progressing. You I don't do have one or two drafts a week, right? I do. Like, yeah, only uh-huh. two drafts a week. That's great. I'm averaging two drafts a week, and I don't have you know I don't have any constructed big decks, but I'm kind of just saving up until. But you probably I could think. net deck one deck by now. Yes, and you've been playing what, a month, absolutely a couple months. Yeah. 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 Like you could, if you could find a top tier deck and build it, you know, something that in real life would cost maybe 800 bucks just from two months of play. That seems really good to me, but there are limitations. So right now, Arena only supports drafting against bots. Against bots. They don't, they don't, you don't draft actually against a group of other people. It has a rotating play style. So coming up where I'm in a singleton thing that'll last a week and a half or two weeks. Um, it does, um, I'm blanking out on the name. What's the other limited format? Uh, sealed. Sealed. It does sealed. There's usually something sealed going in like two draft events. And then the construct is all standard. So if you're not aware, standard is kind of like, what is it? The last approximately 18 to 24 months of cards? Yeah. Um, at least now, and this has changed over time, but right now it is all of the sets from one year in the core set from that year. And then all of the sets from the next year. Okay. And then they'll come out with another core set. There'll be a short overlap. And then all of last year's sets will, will go away. Okay. So between a, a year and two years of cards. Yeah. So that's like the most restrictive in terms of, of cards of constructed magic play. And it's kind of what all the big 
tournaments are or most of the big tournaments are all about that's like this the competitive way it's the biggest one yeah it, it only supports that for now I don't know what they're going to do in the yeah. future. The I don't, other ones I like don't... Modern, which is what, like five or six years of cards or something uh, like that? Modern, I think it's five or six. I don't know if that's I think that's fairly format. popular. I think like... I think Modern is quite popular. Is it? Yeah. Does, is Modern still five years? Or what's the one? There's one that goes back like... Vintage is like everything. There, there's one that doesn't go back all the way to the beginning, but goes back to like three or four years after the beginning. I don't know if there's anything that's like that. popular that's between vintage and modern. I think it's just standard, modern, and vintage are, yeah. the, are the big ones. Okay. And then whatever Commander does. Yeah, maybe. Which yeah. I think is, it's a really modified vintage, I think. Yeah. And they, they all have some tweaks, like band cards. Different band cards, yeah. <laughs> Can't avoid that. Although I, I think right now in standard, there's a very, there's like two. Is that Raptor? I forget what it does, but it's banned. Um, so it only supports standard right now, which I think a lot of people don't really like, the, especially because Commander has gotten so popular. I don't really mind that much. What I would like to see is drafting against real people. That's big. Yeah. Th- Ideally, I'd love to be able to do kind of a, a free gather six or eight people digitally and just draft between you for funsies. I don't think they would do that. Where like no one actually keeps the cards they get just to the exercise of it would be super cool but i think they're probably working on getting a situation where the drafts are actually against other people yeah i don't know if they are or not i mean part of what makes arena tick is it's so easy to get in and get out so when you're drafting but they've got to have the user base to be able to do that when you're drafting against bots you can turn it off and come back later if you're doing it against humans if one of those people leaves it's kind of ruined that whole pod well, you just you if the, if you time out the system was just replaces you with the bot, like it's still kind yeah. of better. I suppose. I guess you could draft against humans in your pod and then play against other random people. That's probably how they'll yeah. do it. I don't think they'll necessarily have a situation where you're playing against the people you're drafting against. So yeah. Anyway, it, it's it's not an exact r- replica of of what you do at the table right now. What what are you looking forward to? Is there anything particular you would like to see Arena do? You know what? I don't. I don't know that I have anything in particular. I I just find myself wishing that I could draft War of the Spark. So I mean, I don't think it's going to. Yeah, ch- they rotated change. out of that real quick. I felt yeah, like. they did like two weeks of War of the Spark, and then two weeks of something else, and now they're going back to War of the Spark pretty soon. So it's like you can't do whatever you want whenever you want. Again, it's not completely replicating the feeling of playing with your friends. Um, so that's a little frustrating, but. You know, I'm just kind of saving up my my gold for when yeah. <laughs> war comes back to draft. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of furthering your understanding and testing out things within the standard card pool, I think it's it's really nicely. Like, I understand these sets better than yeah anything. Well, and it made me I've super excited to to draft with you guys again last week. Yeah, like part of the reason I push for that is because I've been having so much fun with the cards on Arena. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're like, we happen to have eight packs sitting around. It was like, what are we doing? This, this is so much fun. We got to actually do this at the table because I'm having so much fun with it by myself. It's going to, you know, I want the experience around the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're interested, uh, if I remember correctly, even if you don't know the game, the tutorial is quite good. Oh yeah. The tutorial is great. The onboarding is fantastic. You know, they set you up with plenty of cards to have fun. Yeah. It, it, it's not a system that punishes the beginner, you know, and True. and that's, I mean, that's good business for sure. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I mean, it, in terms of like getting into magic, usually you'd have to like have a friend who teach you everything. It's yeah. not like it's an easy game to nah, get into You can play Sparky. You know, yeah, there, you there's, there's their, a, their bot. Yeah. a dumb AI <laughs> <laughs> that you play until, and then it's super easy that you, then you get plunked in the casual queue and it's, it's great. Yeah. Uh, so I, I highly recommend it. You don't it's have to know fun. magic uh, going into it. I think I'll, that'll do it for now. We could certainly have talked about any of these things for significantly longer, but that's an overview of kind of where we're at with magic, our thoughts on the game, both as a game and, and kind of as a business system almost, uh, or multimedia now. They announced the Netflix series, right? Just the other day. Oh, yeah. Netflix is doing an animated series executive produced by the Russo Bros. Yeah, uh, so we'll see how that is. I don't know. I'm I'm skeptical. 
There were a lot of good jokes on Twitter, though, of like, I want to see an entire episode of them of about some blue planeswalkers, and he just cancels everything anyone does. <laughs> oh yeah, there was the, the the other joke was that it's just going to be like the first season is going to be eight se- or eight, eight episodes of not having the mana to, to do, do anything. anything. <laughs> <laughs> they got to introduce some kind of joke in there, something you know, tongue in cheek, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. they got no, to, I that'd be funny. I think it's going to make a great TV show. I mean, as, I'm lo- as, as, as long as the writing is fine. But like the multiverse of magic is an incredible setting. Yeah, but I wonder how much... The thing about magic is that every every card has to have maximum impact. So every, everything on the cards is just like big and explosive. And eh, I don't... For most things. But the settings themselves are are great. Like there are tons of stories that... That exists like all the the settings themselves aren't over the top. They're really cool because they can just be cool, you know, unconnected to anything else because they're on their own plane. Sure. Um, I don't know. My fear is that it'll be too bombastic, but we'll see know. what they do. I don't know. It's got to have good writing, but wait, it, any wait, any why? any show. I, I'm just saying, like, oh, it will need good writing, will need... not that you expect it to have good writing. Yeah, okay. I mean, yes. I think the setting is an incredible setting that could result in an amazing show. I'll agree with that, but remain skeptical. Anyways, that's our <laughs> podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com or on social media on Twitter and Facebook. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast. And again, thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. We appreciate your support very, very much. If you would like to join in and be part of our Discord group and have the opportunity to watch our podcast being recorded live go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer you will also have lots of cool news and information and like a newsletter i put out yeah get on the discord we have lots of fun discussions there challenge direct challenge mark at the thoughtful gamer Wait, what what's you your handle direct challenge? huh i don't even know how you direct challenge there's a negative of arena is you don't have a friends list, so you have to go through oh, that yeah. stupid process to direct challenge. It's someone. really annoying. I want a friends list. Yeah, that would be. They got that's got to be in the works. When There's they, no way they're not working. On when it. they implement it, then you can friend us on Magic Arena. There you go on Magic Arena, and I will be happy to play with people. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>